prognosis, as you all know, for type 1 diabetes has markedly improved, but it, uh, finding a cure, I think, is still very important. I'll say a word about the Eisenbarth model of T1D pathogenesis. And then I'm going to say several things about things that we all know and knew for sure that just are wrong. And that's going to be the theme of everything I talk about today. So why isn't it moving to the, oh, there we go. First of all, prognosis. Um, I, and I've updated, I've given many of these, I've talked about many of these themes before, but I've tried to update all the slides with the latest and uh, I think one of the best ways to monitor the prognosis of people with type 1 diabetes is the Pittsburgh Epidemiology of Diabetes Complication Study. It's not DCCT, it's a different study. But in Allegheny County, they have kept track of every kid diagnosed with type 1 diabetes since 1950. And in previous year's talks, I've told you that if you were diagnosed between 1950 and 1960, your mortality at 20 years was 20%. So that meant kids were dying in their 20s and 30s with of complications from type 1 diabetes. And here's the latest from that group. And, and they don't include those earlier cohorts. No, they just show those diagnosed from 65 to 69 and 70 to 74 and 75 to 80. And in each case, it's about 150. And you can see they're young people. And the point is that now um, with 36 years post-diagnosis, the mortality for the most recent cohort is only 5%, 35 years after type 1 diabetes diagnosis. And I think that that's mostly attributable to the kids smoking less, better blood pressure and blood lipid control, and a, but plus or minus glycemia. And I say that because improved glycemia wasn't considered an important thing until 1993. So these people lived the first 10 to 15 years of their life without improved glycemia. And still, the prognosis is really outstanding at, um, at 35 years. So then why is it with the improved, with the prognosis so much better than why is it still important to uh, find a cure and one is that the prevalence of the disease is, is increasing and we don't really understand why it's increasing. Um, there is a shortened life expectancy overall, but I like to point out that in 2017, uh, a analysis was done of the originally intensively treated cohort in the DCCT and their overall mortality was less, albeit not statistically significant, than age, gender, and race matched controls. The message is not that type 1 diabetes is good for your survival, but that if you have type 1 diabetes, you're told not to smoke, your blood pressure is monitored, you're told to exercise. And those things are have a greater impact on life expectancy than the negative impact of type 1 diabetes. But you know, patients with diabetes hate it. Uh, it's there's hypoglycemia and DKA risk. There's still complications. It's tough to maintain glycemia control, and if nothing more, the the cost of the disease is terrible. Uh, where an individual with type one diabetes, on average, spends something like nineteen thousand dollars more per year for their health than if you don't have the disease. So I'll say a quick word about George Eisenbarth, who was my first attending of medicine when I was an intern at Duke back in 1981. And he popularized what's called the Eisenbarth model of type 1 diabetes pathogenesis that says that you're born with a certain number of beta cells. And then if you're genetically susceptible and something happens, you, you gradually start to lose your beta cell mass in a silent process until you fall below a certain threshold when diabetes is diagnosed, and then you go on to develop brittle diabetes with the time course of years. And you all have heard me say it's, we don't understand an immune response that takes years to kill a mass of tissue that's about the size of a pea. That is if, if 
I got every beta cell out of your pancreas and put it in a tube, it would, it would come to about the size of a pea. And yet it takes years for the immune system to kill those limited number of cells. Well, the, the, the statistician George Box famously said all models are wrong, and, but some are useful. Through the years, the Eisenbarth model has been updated and about five years ago now, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and other disease advocates said we shouldn't wait to call it diabetes, type one diabetes, when the blood sugar goes up. It's already a disease when you can predict who's gonna get type one diabetes based on autoantibodies. So the current nomenclature for uh, type 1 diabetes pathogenesis is it said that you have st stage 1 disease when you have two or more autoantibodies against the beta cell, stage 2 disease when your blood sugar starts to go up and you have autoantibodies, and clinical type 1 diabetes or stage 3 when you meet the glycemia control threshold. So this is the latest staging of the Eisenbarth model. And because the FDA accepted that it's disease, when you have stage two, your blood sugars still are not sufficiently high to cause complications, but they said, this is a disease now, stage two. They recently, based upon this study, approved anti-CD3 to plizumab to treat relatives, uh, relatives and, and those at high genetic risk uh, to prevent disease because stage two is now a disease. Your blood sugars are normal, but you have autoantibodies. And it was based upon this study from five years ago, non-diabetic first degree relatives of someone with type one diabetes and they enrolled 76. And I like to point out, it took seven years to enroll the 76 patients in this study. You had to be at least eight years old. You had to have at least two islet autoantibodies. And you, you didn't have blood sugars consistent with type 1 diabetes, but they weren't normal. There was dysglycemia. And patients, the um, subjects were assigned a 14-day course of the anti-CD3. And you've all seen these findings, so I'll go through them quickly. But if, if you are assigned to the drug, uh, you had a decreased risk and a delayed onset of developing type 1 diabetes, such that at the five-year endpoint, um, 25 of the 44 patients that received the drug did not yet have diabetes. Now, this they've continued to go on to get diabetes, but the proponents of this study point out that there's a two- to three-year delay to disease onset, and so that's worth it and the FDA approved it. And yet, I have some problems with this study, and I know I'm in the minority, and people don't like it when I say these things, but I still say them. Uh, I have some concerns about giving anti-CD3 to someone before they have symptoms, uh, before their blood sugars are high enough to cause symptoms or complications. And I understand that there are some conditions for which we do initiate therapy before someone's ever sick, like seat belts for everybody that drives in a car now. We mandate that you have to wear a seat belt. We give vaccinations for serious infections that you might never get. We fluoridate the water to prevent tooth decay. We give blood pressure medicines for people that don't have any symptoms and the, the, the blood pressure thresholds have gotten tighter and tighter over my career. And we give statins to lower cholesterol with ever lower cholesterol levels. But I argue that in all these cases, the interventions are inexpensive, they're very effective, and they're known to be very safe. So I ask the rhetorical question, is that true for anti-CD3? Well, for one thing, a 14-day course of anti-CD3 is almost $200,000. And for another thing, we don't know its long-term safety. And the proponents of it will say, yeah, but we haven't seen any complications in the patients that have received this in clinical trials. But worldwide, there have been 1,000 patients or less that have gotten anti-CD3. 
And if you get your spleen out, you only have about a one in 500 chance of developing a serious infection from the splenectomy, but it's one in 500. So we wouldn't know that yet for teplizumab, and we're treating young people with a therapy that touches every single T cell in their body in an indiscriminate way and weakens it. So I have concerns about it. And then it's also, there's a couple other things that are very frequently said, and you'll read them. They'll say that we can now identify virtually all who will go on to develop type 1 diabetes. And so I asked the rhetorical question, is that true? And even if we could, with complete accuracy, predict when some, that someone was going to go on to type 1 diabetes, do we know when that will occur? Because you would think the time to treat would be important. So let's look at the first question. Oh, and, and to, to, it, even if you knew uh, who was going to get disease and when they were going to get it, still in, in deciding on whether or not you should treat somebody should uh, depend upon how severe the disease is, how costly the therapy is, and that therapy's long-term profile. All right, how about how good are we at predicting who is going to get type 1 diabetes? You've all heard and read, we can do this now with great accuracy. Well, I'm just going to cite a few recent papers that will belie that statement. It's an exaggeration. It's not true. This is one of those studies. It's from the Teddy study led by Jeff Krischer, and he follows either first-degree relatives at high HLA risk uh, or the general population, or first degree relatives of someone with type 1 diabetes or someone with a high HLA risk. And you can see eight years after diagnosis, uh, only about 33% of these people with multiple autoantibodies go on to get type 1 diabetes in eight years. And then this is taken from a recent review by Emily Sims published in the JCEM, but it's really data that uh, Annette Ziegler published uh, with Marian Rewers and Ali Samel, um, what, 10 years ago. And they looked at the general population of people with multiple islet autoantibodies. And at 15 years, 84% of them had type 1 diabetes. And here's where people misread what they wrote. They say, they say we project that perhaps 100% will get diabetes over their lifetime. But I asked Annette Ziegler about six months ago, how many of the, of the 550 that you are followed beginning in 2000 don't have diabetes? And it's still 15%. 15% now, 20 years later, are still diabetes free. And if you have just a single islet antibody, the, the predictive power of that is really much less. There are predictors of faster progression. If you have multiple autoantibodies below age five, you're at greater risk, but then you're also at greater danger of a lifelong immune, it's something that touches every immune cell in your body at age five. And notice that none of the studies have treated anybody below age five, so we don't know. And I, and I think if we don't know, we should be cautious. What about, uh, once you know someone's going to get disease, when are they going to get it? And this is another study that George Eisenbarth did now, published 15 years ago. And what you're looking at here is identical twins. Um, in each triangle or each diamond is a SIB pair. So this means that one SIB was diagnosed at age three and the other one was di diagnosed around age three. If they were all diagnosed around the same time, they'd all fall on this line of identity. And you're looking at 11 of those SIB pairs, but let's look at the other 10. There's huge disparity between when this one, this one my member of the twin pair was diagnosed around age seven, the other one about age 12. And in some cases, here's another one around age 12 when the identical twin was diagnosed age 48. Does that mean you treat this identical twin 38 years prior to prevent his diabetes or here, hers or her diabetes 38 years later and that whole time they're subject to uh, some immune problems? I, I don't think so. 
So 11 of the 12 twin pairs were quite discordant with regard to disease onset, despite the fact that they're identical twins raised in the same environment. Um, and we also know that type 1 diabetes has a very slow and unpredictable prodrome. These are studies from intervention trials following individuals with multiple autoantibodies every six months with an oral glucose tolerance test. And we know that some of those in this, in this cohort progressed to diabetes. They were called the progressors, and some were non-progressors. And Jay Sisenko went back and looked at their oral glucose tolerance tests one, one and a half, and two years prior to their diagnosis with diabetes. And what you can see is that the 80% the that didn't progress, their pancreatic function stayed the same. Those that did progress showed an a inexorable, inexorable but gradual loss of beta cell function. This is just another way for time for me to say, remember, it's about the size of a pea in your pancreas and your immune system is just very gradually chewing away at the beta cells. Unless, it, but we do know that shortly after disease onset, the rate of beta cell decline is, is increased for about a year after disease onset, and then it levels out again. All right, so the, the decline in beta cell function is highly variable from person to person. We know it's influenced by age and other factors. So how do you know when to treat uh, when it's all a black box to us? And this is just a large study showing the variability and the decline in beta cell function depending on your age. Younger people lose their beta cell mass faster. Older people beyond the age of 18 lose their beta cell mass at a slower rate, and we don't understand that either. Once the immune process starts against the beta cell, is it inexorable? And this is another paper from the Teddy study from Jeff Krischer's group at University of Florida. And they followed people with a single autoantibody either until they developed multiple autoantibodies or until the antibody went away. And we don't talk about this much, but 25% of people with autoantibodies against the beta cell, they just go away. So the immune response appears to get started and then it goes away. Um, if you look at uh, individuals that start off with a single autoantibody and revert, like I told you, 25% do, they don't go on to get diabetes. Many people stay as a single autoantibody positive, and their risk for diabetes, I've told you, after seven years is only about 15%. And even those that go on to multiple autoantibodies, it's only about 33% after seven years. And these are, by the way, the, I'm not cherry picking these studies. These are the uh, classic, well done, highly regarded studies of type one diabetes pathogenesis. And unfortunately, I think we just too often ignore. So, um, we don't understand that immune process. We don't understand the kinetics of it. And it's not entirely predictive of who is going to get disease. And yet we're intervening uh, or trying to. And then just, I, I cite this. Uh, this isn't really consistent with the theme of the rest of the things I'm talking about. But I cite it because it was a study of 61 million commercially insured Americans with these criteria for type 1 diabetes that are not perfect, but they're pretty good. And you'll also hear that type 1 diabetes is a disease of youth. It is true that the peak incidence is around age 14, but since, uh, since we live beyond age 14, if you, if you measure the area under the curve, you are more likely to be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes after age 18 than before age 18. So it's just not right that it's a childhood disease. It's frequent then, but it occurs throughout life. Um, all right, so now based upon everything I've told you so far, we've done, we've, we've, all of our research over the last several decades has been based on the Eisenbarth model. The assumption being that the beta cells, uh, an innocent victim, 
and the immune system's in there killing it. So we should figure out how to weaken the immune system. And after all those decades, the only therapy that's been approved is the teplizumab to prevent type one clinical type one diabetes for those with multiple autoantibodies and um, dysglycemia. And I've already told you, I have reservations even about this. There have been many, many other studies, 50 or more, but recently there have been some studies that have shown that they can preserve uh, beta cell function. None of them have been approved by the FDA, however, because none have significantly affected the recipient's insulin requirements. So none of them have been FDA approved. And some surprises that I'll go through briefly are that some therapies that don't act on the immune system are looking like they're as effective as these immune modifying drugs. So it raises the question, is the beta cell itself playing a role in disease pathogenesis? I'll just show you a couple of papers that were published in the December issue of New England Journal that you probably all saw, but teplizumab again, the anti-CD3 given to individuals with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes, young adults diagnosed within the previous six weeks. They had to have at least one anti islet autoantibody, and they had to have a fairly good amount of endogenous pancreatic insulin production. They got two 12-day courses of teplizumab. So remember, I told you the cost of a single course is $193,000. So now you're talking about $400,000 for two courses of this therapy. And it was a large study, 217 assigned to teplizumab, 111 placebo. And they found and reported that, um, that teplizumab preserved pancreatic insulin production. And by the way, there's an early, in, an early improvement, but then the beta cell function starts to decline again. So you're getting a, a, a delay in the beta cell loss but there was no significant difference in the patient's blood glucose time and range, nor th these looked like they would be statistically significant, but they weren't. Uh, no significant change in their daily insulin requirement. In that same issue of the New England Journal, they reported on a, a drug, baricitinib, that interferes with JAK stat uh, functioning. And I, I prefer this to anti-CD3 because anti-CD3 hits every single T cell and affects that T cell for as long as it lives. But this is uh, a, a more targeted innate uh, immune system inhibitor that is an oral agent and you can stop it and the immune system theoretically should return to normal. And they also reported uh, that um, patients had preserved pancreatic insulin production but again, no significant change in the insulin dose and no significant change in the glycemia control achieved. So what's the problem? Why, why have we spent literally billions of dollars on scores of immunotherapy trials and nothing has made it into the clinic? And I have several possible and probably a mixture of all these things as to why it's been frustrating like that. We, we for years, and I know this frustrates Dale and John Mortis and others, we've studied the NOD mouse model and it's just led us astray and I'll show you some data. Perhaps an individual's number of pancreatic beta cells plays a role in the pathogenesis. Perhaps human disease is much more heterogeneous than we've thought. Perhaps treatment kinetics matter, and I've told you we don't know when to treat, and perhaps we just don't understand the autoimmune process very well, and I think that's absolutely true. We don't. So these are just a list of some of the, now I think it's something like 400 different therapies that have been shown to prevent diabetes in the nod NOS model. None of them have worked in humans. And yet, up, up until recently, you couldn't study a therapy in humans until you had demonstrated it was eff efficacious in the NOD or another animal model. So we just stuck to our guns. Eisenbarth's model's right. We got to find the right immunosuppression, despite all this data that says maybe we should be thinking elsewhere. Um, 
And then you could ask, when does type 1 diabetes actually begin? And I would argue it begins at conception. If so, you know, you could say that we're all pre-diabetes, just like we're all pre-death. Uh, this is a study that was published now five years ago by Martha Campbell Thompson from University of Florida. And she looked at first degree relatives of someone with type one diabetes. Here's the, um, the size of the pancreas of control subjects. And surprisingly, if you are a family member of someone with type one diabetes and you don't even have autoantibodies, your pancreas is 25% smaller. So there's something about the pancreata of individuals at risk for diabetes, even before you can measure an immune response it's not normal or it's, it's different, smaller pancreatic cell mass, pancreas mass. I like this study because there's nothing much new under the stun. It's, it's now what, um, 63 plus 24. So uh, 87 years old, Ogilvy wanted to know what the, um, what the pancreas did as we grew and matured and uh, he also, using very rudimentary histopathomorphological studies, found that the beta cell mass grows in infants, plateaus, and then around age 14 grows again, and then it's fairly stable throughout life. And notice that the peak incidences of diabetes are during this growth phase and during this growth phase. So it could be that individuals are basically outgrowing their beta cell mass. Those beta cells are getting stressed and it's that which is stimulating an anti-beta cell immune response. So that's a very old study, but it's held up. Peter Butler, a few years ago, published this measuring the number of beta cells in non-diabetic individuals. These folks don't have diabetes. And everybody listening to this call right now if we cut out our hearts and measured them, it would be a certain number, plus or minus 20 to 30%, everybody. Livers, same thing. 100, it would be a certain number, plus or minus 30%. And yet human beta cell mass in, among non-diabetic individuals varies by a factor of 10. Here's an individual that didn't have diabetes that had three gram uh, beta cell mass, and here's an individual, same age, about 0.3. And we don't understand that. So this is, to me, one of the big questions of T1D pathogenesis. Why is it, why is the number of beta cells in the pancreas so highly variable? And what dictates that? Probably genes are some of it. Certainly genes are some of it. Now I want to talk about the role that the beta cell plays in T1D pathogenesis or evidence to suggest it does. And I'll go back to, I, I always talk about the DCCT because I think it's, after the discovery of insulin, the most important paper in diabetes history. And the DCCT studied the glucose hypothesis that when John Mortis, Mike Thompson, Samir, Leslie, and I were in medical school, we were taught the glucose hypothesis. And these are our textbooks, these are my textbooks. And if you read it, it's, it's, it's almost condescending. Most diabetologists doubt that metabolic control influences vascular disease, but they treat in the hope that maybe it will or the textbook of medicine. If one believes that hyperglycemia is unrelated to the occurrence of the vascular syndrome, then one will reduce blood sugar only to such a level as to minimize signs of hyperglycemia and stuff. So that's what the prevailing opinion was until the DCCT was done. Why did it take 50 years to test the glucose hypothesis? It's because we couldn't control the blood sugar. We didn't have the tools to do it. We monitored urines and didn't have sophisticated insulin or insulin pumps. But in the uh, mid 1980s, we had sufficient tools to control the blood sugar that they initiated this study. 1,441 patients, half were designed, assigned to get intensive glycemia control, half to conventional. Half the patients had retinopathy already, half didn't. 
And uh, it's important for the fellows to know the nuances of this study backwards and forwards, because the mean age of people when they got into the study was 27 years. It was the range of 13 to 39 years. But these are young adults. Either you had the disease for one to five years or a secondary intervention group that already had some albuminuria who had the disease for one to 15 years, meaning mean five, nine years. And when I say conventional therapy, the therapy back then was you got two or fewer injections a day. You maybe monitored your blood sugar once a day. You got a quarterly A1C, a quarterly visit. And the crazy idea they had was let's try to get blood sugars as close to normal as possible with three or more shots of insulin a day and an insulin pump. Hospitalization when the therapy was uh, initiated and, and monthly follow-up visits. And they succeeded. They got patients hemoglobin A1Cs down to about 7% for nine and a half years compared to what most people had an a as an A1C back then because it kept them out of the hospital. They didn't have DKA or hyperglycemia of a hemoglobin A1C of about 9%. And uh, after the DCCT closed, this group was no longer getting monthly visits and their glycemia control deteriorated. This group, you know, they recognized glycemia control is important and they improved some, but still to a, just a mean A1C of 8%. And when you did subgroup analyses at just how well the glycemia was controlled, the intensively treated group, many of them had an A1C of say less than 7.5%, but there were others that didn't do well at all. And then there were some in the conventionally treated group who did do well. But just on an, an intention to treat analysis, those assigned to the intensively treated group, you all know, had markedly diminished microvascular complications that were statistically significant, but also very clinically relevant and that was published in 1993, and that changed everything. So now you have to try to achieve better glycemia control. And it took another um, 12 years for enough cardiovascular endpoints to uh, occur, but the intensive treatment also markedly diminished major adverse cardiovascular events too. So tight glycemia control is no longer something that only weird endocrinologists try to achieve it should be the goal. In fact, I, I say the fact that we are still in this country at an average A1C of about 8% is an absolute indictment of our healthcare system, in my view. We should all be striving for this, not this. So what, what is the evidence that the beta cell plays a role in the T1D pathogenic process? Another clue from the DCCT I think a strong signal, as I told you, there were 1,441 patients enrolled and that 855 of those had had diabetes for five years or less. So if you look at just those, about 30% still made significant amounts of pancreatic insulin uh, um, five years within five years of their diagnosis. So the first question they asked in this study was, were these people different from these people? What, what, what was it about these people that their pancreas was still making a lot of insulin? <clears throat> and what they found is that they tended, to hit, they tended to be older. I already showed you, the older you are, the slower it is that you lose your beta cells. Their disease duration was uh, shorter, but they also required less insulin. They had better baseline A1Cs. They had less retinopathy. Their conclusion was, it's a good thing if your pancreas still makes some insulin. Then they said, okay, the DCCT told us we need to control everybody's blood sugar. Does it matter, since we're going to treat everybody intensively now, does having your pancreas make some insulin make the intensive treatment easier? And the answer there was, yes, it does. If your pancreas is still making some insulin, you have less retinopathy and you have fewer hypoglycemia events. So we're gonna treat everybody like this now. It's a good thing if your pancreas is still making significant insulin. And then the punchline of the study was they said, how about this group that was still making insulin? If you compared those who were treated intensively compared to conventional, did the intensive insulin 
treatment preserved their pancreatic insulin production better, and it did. So if you have a C peptide greater than six nanograms per mil and you're treated intensively, your pancreatic insulin production is preserved compared to those who were not treated intensively. So the conclusion is that intensive glycemia control either blunts the immune response or I think it promotes beta cell survival and function, but we don't understand how that's occurring. So I told you that um, recently, this is also published last year, therapies other than immunosuppression have been shown to preserve beta cell function just as well as the immunosuppressive agents. And I can go through the long story for those who want to know it, but this multi-center, randomized controlled study gave young people 17 years within 30 days of their diagnosis and autoantibodies, verapamil, a once daily blood pressure pill that we know is safe because we've been using it for decades and we know it's inexpensive. And they compared their peptide, C-peptide area under the curve and this was statistically significant. So verapamil preserved beta cell function without doing anything to these patients' immune system, just as well as anti-CD3 or baricitinib or any of the other ones. So it does make you go back and look at the Eisenbarth model and say, maybe we should be focusing more on the beta cell and a little bit less on the immune system. Another thing that we've known for years and study after study shows this is that we always said, going back to the Eisenbarth model, that everybody with diabetes loses their pancreatic insulin production. And yet the T1D exchange found that if you're diagnosed with type one diabetes over age 18, even when you're 40 years out from diagnosis, there's still a one in six chance that you have significant pancreatic insulin production. And for those diagnosed below age 18, you got about a one in 20 chance. So at this recent NPOD meeting, I was asked, would I reclassify diabetes? And I would, I would do away with type one and type two. I would call everybody diabetes and say, some classify them and say, some have an autoimmune component, some don't, some still make insulin, some don't. And let us base therapy on those things rather than arbitrary diagnoses of type one or type two diabetes. And this finding of pancreatic insulin production is now found by many different people. This is the Exeter group where they use a urinary uh, re ratio of C peptide to creatinine. And they find that the majority of individuals, even those with very long standing diabetes still have measurable pancreatic insulin production. And here is just another paper from that same group finding that uh, you can find measurable, it's not clinically significant, but measurable levels of uh, pancreatic insulin production in up to 80% of individuals with even long-standing type 1 diabetes, clinically diagnosed type 1 diabetes. Can we do anything with that? pancreatic insulin producing capacity? And I think the answer is yes, although the insurance companies don't want to believe it. There have been two studies called the adjunct studies that tested twice daily liraglutide in addition to insulin in individuals with type 1 diabetes. There was adjunct 1 and adjunct 2. In adjunct 1, they they altered the insulin dose to achieve glycemia targets in adjunct two. They just kept the insulin dose capped. And then they looked at uh, change from baseline in A1C, change from baseline in insulin dose, and change from baseline in, in body weight. Remember this one, they adjusted the insulin dose. This one, they didn't. Notice that in all cases, the A1C improved, although it didn't reach statistically significant predetermined endpoints. So both of these studies were considered negative, but look at the trends. In all cases, the patients did better with that. It had better A1Cs. They required less insulin and they lost weight. But then they did something that you're not allowed to do, but I'll, they did it and I'll, I'll show you. They went back and said, how about if we look at the people that had a C peptide of at least uh, 
0.12 nanomoles per liter. That would be about 0.36 uh, nanograms per deciliter for those of you who are more familiar with the nanograms per deciliter. And when you did that and looked at just the 15% who had easily measurable C peptide, there were significant statistically significant differences in their hemoglobin A1Cs, insulin dose, and, and other things. So if you find someone with longstanding type 1 diabetes and they have a C peptide of, let's say, 0.3 nanograms per mil, I think they should be treated with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, and there's data to support it. And then, of course, for those of you who saw the most recent or uh, the New England Journal last year, Paresh Dandana has now begun treating adults he sees within three months of diagnosis with a long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist. I show this letter, but it's not a controlled study, so take this one of all the things I've told you with the greatest grain of salt. But nevertheless, if he started... Um, Ozempic in these young people with uh, recent onset type 1 diabetes, he was able to stop basal insulin in all, or prandial insulin in all of them. And uh, most of them, he stopped basal insulin as well. And their glycemia control is outstanding. We'll see uh, what the longer term controlled follow up of that is. All right, then we said since beta cell function persists in uh, individuals with type 1 diabetes, what can we do about it? Um, can we get human beta cells to proliferate or regenerate? And I've shown you this before, so I'll fly through it. We did a study where we uh, took advantage of the bomb curve. For uh, decades, we've known how much C14 is in the atmosphere. And it's always been quite low until we did nuclear atmospheric testing when it peaked. But then when that was stopped, the number of C, the amount of C14 has fallen ever since. That allows one to go in and isolate the DNA, for instance, from a tree ring. And by measuring how much C14 is in the DNA of that tree ring, you can tell when the DNA it was made. So we did that. Uh, oh, and by the way, the half-life of C14 is 6,000 years. So this decline is not because the C14 is decaying, decaying, it's because it's dissolving in the oceans and dissipating throughout the world. So we did that for beta cells. And we looked at a, a woman who died of a brain trauma. And I think it was 2007. And we isolated the beta cells from her pancreas. And we found that her beta cells had been created, been created about 1950 to 1955, which meant that she lived the last 55 years of her life with beta cells that were 50 or 60 years old, and she wasn't making new ones. And we've done that also in uh, patients that received uh, thymidine analogs, BRD or IDU, because they had cancer, and it was used as a way to measure how quickly the cancer was dividing. And we found uh, 18 people who had had that done at the NIH, and they had at autopsy their pancreas preserved, so we were able to see if their beta cells stained with BRD or IDU. And the bottom line is, if you were young when you died, 1% to 2% of your beta cells stained, for, suggesting that the beta cells had divided in the 18 to 20 years olds. But we looked at people beyond the age of 30, we never saw a single beta cell that had any thymidine incorporate or IDU or B, uh, BRDU incorporation. So our conclusion was beta cells show any significant rate of cell regeneration up until age 30 or so, and then we're stuck with those beta cells for the rest of our lives. What about the fact that you've learned that, beta, that type 1 diabetes is a beta cell specific autoimmune disorder? We've known for decades that that's not true. If you look at measures of exocrine function, patients with type 1 diabetes relative to controls have less, less chymotrypsin in their, in their stool. Uh, patients with type 1 diabetes relative to those with type 2 diabetes have less elastase. And then a, a recent meta-analysis of all studies looking at pancreatic exocrine function and type 1 diabetes published in pancreas in 2016 found the bicarbonate production, virtually any measure you want to do, 
individuals with type 1 diabetes have diminished exocrine function as well as beta cell function. So it's a pancreas, it's a whole pancreas disease, and we've only focused on the beta cell. Okay, what about uh, for those individuals who do lose too much of their endogenous pancreatic function, can we give them back beta cells and, and therefore restore euglycemia that way? And I'm taking, this is a recent report from the International Collaborative Islet Transplant Registry Investigators. And on the one hand, they say, yes, it's a smashing to success. We have 50 to 78% of people still have graft survival for at least five years and their blood sugar is better and they have decreased severe hypoglycemia. On the other hand, if you look at the incidence of failure defined as an A1C greater than 7% severe hypoglycemia or C peptide falling before below 0.2, it's 70% at five years. Uh, and then, then there's other measures of glucose control. This is from their paper. And uh, these are patients that need islets from in, in, in at least over half the cases, more than two donors and they are still getting all the immunosuppressive agents that we know are associated with increased morbidity and mortality. So I just, I just don't, I never got that this is quote unquote, the cure. And we published our analysis back in 2001 and the number of islet transplants fell. Then there was a flurry of islet transplants across North America with these studies. And now that the studies have been published, you can see the number is vanishingly small again. Despite that, in April 2021, the FDA convened a committee to decide whether or not they should grant a license for patients to be treated with cadaveric islets. And I voted no. I was one of the four that voted no. 12 voted yes. But the question they asked was, is there an overall favorable benefit risk profile for some patients with type 1 diabetes. And I don't disagree that some people benefit. The trouble is you don't know who's going to benefit and you're far more likely to be hurt than benefited. And, and I will tell you, Ralph Nader had people there listening in on this committee and they wrote an open letter to the FDA outrage that, that it was approved, strongly opposes the approval of the not cell is what they call their purified islets because the clinical trials of the product failed to provide substantial evidence that it has a favorable benefit risk profile. And it was furthermore, it was based on very small trials. I felt railroaded by this committee thing, um, but it, it's been approved. There's a, they have a BLA to administer islets to people now. The real problem, I think, with pancreatic islet transplantation is two. One is the immunosuppressive agents. The other one is that, that we will never get enough cadaveric islets for it to mean to have any significant impact on individuals with type 1 diabetes. But this was a review that I co-authored now 15 years ago, and we dreamed about the ability to make embryonic stem cells or induce pluripotent stem cells into beta cells. And then Doug Melton at Harvard figured out that it could be done. And he proposed in this review three years ago that maybe we could certainly use these cells to figure out what causes type one diabetes, or maybe we could encapsulate them, or maybe we could figure out how to modify them so that they wouldn't require immunosuppression. And I just wanna show you what this current status is of encapsulating human islets. This is from Danny Pippeler's group in Belgium looking at 12 months post-implant of encapsulated islets, despite also giving immunosuppressive agents. And these levels of C-peptide in four of the 10 are minuscule. So it's, it's, it's not showing great promise. And I don't think it will. I think there's fundamental problems with this approach. But then as I think you all know, Vertex initiated a clinical trial enrolling patients between the ages of 18 and 65 who'd had diabetes for at least five years and evidence of severe hypoglycemia. And to much fanfare in November 2021, the New York Times reported that a human here shown got 
stem cell derived islets in an islet transplant, still needed immunosuppressive, but he was off insulin. And here's his specific data that was shown at the ADA now two years ago. Here's his insulin requirements prior to getting this, the stem cell derived islets. His time and range was 40%, his A1C was 8.6%. I think every diabetes provider on the call would be able to help a patient like this do better than this. This was a CGM report recording, but that's what he did. He got the stem cell derived dialects and within six months, he was on only two units of insulin a day with 80% of his blood sugars in range and an A1C of 6.7%. And by nine months, he was off insulin with a normal hemoglobin A1C and this CGM report. So it's remarkable. I, I, this is the talking dog experiment. You can't say that stem cell derived islets won't work because they do. Just like you wouldn't say, if I brought a dog on stage that it talked to you, you wouldn't say, yeah, but it's only one dog. That this works, it can work. Sadly, uh, now three months ago or two, six weeks ago, Vertex had to stop the trial because two of the 14 patients they treated with their stem cell derived islets had died. The annual death rate for people with longstanding severe diabetes is 1% or less. The death rate in this trial is 14%. It, it's bad. And it wasn't the cell product, they say, that, that did it. Uh, they, but they don't, they've been vague about what caused the deaths. I've heard, I, I believe I know what caused the deaths, but it, it's not publicly known yet. So our JRF group that I see Dale's on the call, and I don't know if anybody else in our group is, but all of us are working to figure out how to genetically manipulate these stem cell derived islets that we can grow in the lab. Now, when I say we, I mean Sam Reddick and her team. And we are uh, putting those SC islets into mice with no immune system that Dale and Mike and Lenny Schultz have been perfecting over the last several decades. And then we can put in adult immune cells and rather than put humans at risk, we can watch how these immune cells interact with the same donors, SC islets, and try to figure out either ways to genetically manipulate them or come up with safer regimens to preserve those beta cells so that we can legitimately cure the disease. So I've gone very fast, but my messages are that we are Working on that, that because therapies for type 1 diabetes and the prognosis of the disease is constantly improving, it makes it difficult to find the therapeutic equipoise when a, when a new therapy, especially an immunotherapy, would be safe for individuals with diabetes. Transplant therapies are, have been limited by beta cell supply, but I think that problem is going away with these stem cell approaches. All of the problems associated with immunosuppressive agents persist. Many different immunotherapies have been shown to at least temporarily preserve pancreatic insulin production, but I wonder about the long-term safety. And I'm very encouraged by the recent findings that things like verapamil and GLP-1 receptor agonists appear to also preserve beta cell, pancreatic beta cell function. And then there's everybody that that I need acknowledge. Uh, some of the stuff I did, I did at the NIH with Alan and Klaus and uh, other scientists there. Of course, we've got great colleagues here at UMass Chan, in particular, Dale, Mike, Sally, Sam, Dynamite. Lenny Schultz is a, a magician with these mice. And then Doug Melton is the, the father of much of what I talked about. We've got a great team at the JDRF Center here and thank the funding sponsors too. So that's it. I, I hope it's, I, I, I almost went over, but there's three minutes for questions if anybody wants to ask any. Mike. D yeah, Dave, thank you so much for bringing us an update on this material. And I, I just want to say that I think the FDA and the JDRF are lucky to have your insight and balanced approach as you as they deal with these sticky issues. It's really amazing times. These these, these regenerate these stem cell islets too that 
trying to modify so they'll be off the shelf products are fascinating. Yeah. But I did want to ask a question and I jumped on first for questions. I'm sorry, because I'm going to leave for clinic after my question, after I hear your answer. But with the GLP-1 um, therapies that you for these nuance, uh, nuances with persistent C peptide, it reminds me also of a question I had with from Matthias with his with his organoid GLP-1 info, information. You're using an insulin secretagogue. How do we know we're not just I mean, you know, how do we know we're not just having a sulfonylurea effect on these beta cells? I mean, it increases C-peptide and lowers blood sugar and decreases insulin requirement. Why do we, why are we latched on to the idea that they're beta cells protective somehow? It, it, it's, it's always very difficult to tease it out, Mike, but I can tell you Dale's on the call, I think still, but we, we don't know in, in humans, but I can tell you that in mice, Dale and I did a study with Novo Nordisk where they had another GLP-1 receptor agonist and we purposely transplanted an insufficient number of beta cells to a diabetic mouse, one of Dale's Nodskid gamma mice. And if you do that, the insufficient number of islets, they will work for a while and then they die. But if you treat those mice with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, the beta cells don't die. It's, and it could also be that maybe the mice are eating less or who knows, we, but it works. <laughs> it preserves their pancreatic insulin production. And there's other studies like that that suggest it has some effect on the beta cell. But I, it, we don't know for sure. You could be right. And then Samir, you're next. Thanks, Dave. That was a wonderful talk as always and a great overview of, of, of everything to do with um, you know, preventing type 1 diabetes as it stands today. So, you know, I had a question about the immunotherapy and, and I, I share your concerns about the tepluzumab. And and even after it's been approved, I don't see too many people getting it because I'm, I think the patients, they share the concerns too. But I, I don't know what your opinion is on, on the advantage of, of having such therapies, even though they may not work, on the advantage of having them FDA approved because what it's doing is it's bringing awareness and then, you know, people are getting more aware of stage two of type one diabetes and families are getting tested. So that, that will probably increase the pool of uh, study subjects for, for future studies to prevent diabetes. What are your thoughts on that? You know, for, if people want it, at least a lot of people are going to get tested and, and, and we'll, we'll know that, you know, how many people are at risk and, they might benefit from other therapies. I, I I absolutely agree, and there are start there are studies that show, for instance, if you know you're autoantibody positive, the risk of you developing DKA goes way down. On the other hand, um, I will tell you that uh, a JDRF sponsor that Dale and I and Mike know extremely well. Her daughter was diagnosed with type one diabetes when she was about ten. And her son was tested right afterwards because they're very plugged in. He's been autoantibody positive for 36 years now. <laughs> and he said, on the other, I just never go to bed at night comfortable. I, I'm always thinking, when am I going to get type 1 diabetes? So there are psychological costs to testing that we shouldn't diminish. Still, I think it's a good thing. And, and we are, knowledge is good. I just don't want to do, I don't want to put people at risk of an immunotherapy for our scientific advances. And informed consent is something that's extremely difficult to really obtain. No, and, and you're right, I have a colleague, I have, so I, and, you know, I don't test that many people for stage two, but I have a colleague of ours who, who has type one diabetes and, and, and her daughter had antibodies and had an impaired glucose tolerance. This was many years ago. Uh, at least 10 years ago, and there's no diabetes yet. So there are uh, probably plenty of people. But I think it will just help us to understand the natural history more if more people get tested and, and get these tests done. Yeah, I think more and more, and, you know, now that glucose, the, the, the CGMs are coming, we're, we're going to learn a lot more. But but just because just because we don't know doesn't mean to me that we should violate primum non nocere. We still need to not do harm as we're trying to learn, in my view. John Mortis has a question. First, 
I would say that that was an exceedingly lovely overview of uh, type 1 diabetes uh, biology. I had a couple of questions. One is, uh, as you are aware, Dr. Greiner, in the old diabetes division, did a number of studies on the uh, promise of anti-CD40 ligand treatment for uh, diabetes prevention and transplantation. And uh, those studies were abandoned because the antibody in use was shown to have thrombogenic properties. But last week in the New England Journal, a study of a new version of CD40 ligand was uh, shown to be efficacious in uh, multiple sclerosis in preliminary studies. Do you uh, think that the DCOE should revisit CD40 ligand? And my second question has to do with... Uh, the studies that you may be aware of that I did with Libby Blankenhorn showing that at least in one animal model, specific T cell ligand, T cell receptor um, uh, clonotypes played an important role in diabetes. And there is now a new T1D T cell receptor, beta cell receptor um, genetic data repository that's been set up. And I'm wondering if the Diabetes Center is participating in it. No, so you had two questions. The first one was with regard to the anti-CD40, um, anti-CD154 antibody. I haven't said the, read the paper yet, but I'm aware of it. And uh, there have been, there actually, since those studies from the early 90s, there's four different new anti-CD154 antibodies in various forms of testing. The one that was reported in New England Journal, I think is the most promising one. Uh, and yet, John, as you know, kind of paradoxically, there's differences um, in type one diabetes. If you have DQ beta 0602 or whatever it is, I get them all mixed up, but that's a, a highly protective allele for type one diabetes, but the most predictive allele for multiple sclerosis. So there's there's nuances of the immune system that are tricky. Would I, would I wanna test anti-CD154? There is a study going on with that right now and nuance of type one diabetes. Uh, I talked to Jason Gallia last week, and, and he wants to try to put together a study mixing a couple immunotherapies, something for induction, then anti-CD154. Yeah, you're right. It was That was remarkable therapy back then, remarkable. So I don't know. Time will tell. And then about the uh, um, anti-T cell receptor we just came from the NPOD meeting, and there are people now, you can actually look at the T cell repertoire that you obtain from people with type 1 diabetes, and from that, deconvolute what their MHC haplotype would be. So, you know, we're learning so much about the immune synapse. If we could find a specific class of T cells like you did in the rat that would blunt the anti beta cell immune response in a specific way, that could be dynamite. But it's I know that human type 1 diabetes is a lot more variable than rodent diabetes in, as far as the immune response goes. But maybe. I, I won't say it couldn't work. It's a good idea. We have T-cell receptor MHC haplotype data um, from Teddy that um, I was not able to analyze before I retired because of funding issues. But I just wanted to let you know that those uh, those data are out there and could be analyzed by somebody. Right. Sally, you are next. Yeah, this is just in response to uh, John Mortis's question. Yes, John, we are participating in that uh, TCR uh, bank um, with my islet uh, specific uh, T cells. So we're part of that initiative as well. Thanks, yeah, Sally. <laughs> Thanks. Sally. I think that's great. And Sally, I can tell you at NPOD, your, your name came up a million times. Oh, you were there, but you were you were not there for some of the day. But yeah, people were talking about your studies a lot, as you may or may not know, because you were sick that one day. Richard. And Dave, as you, you know, two weeks ago, Dr. Van Horath presented data suggesting that the primary defect in type 1 diabetes might be in the beta cell rather than the immune system. Yeah. And presumably the mill works by stabilizing beta cells. It has no effect on the immune system. So do you think we're down the wrong rat hole, rabbit hole trying to attack the immune system rather than trying to figure out what's wrong with the beta cells? Well, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend to know what I don't know. All, all I all I can say is there is clear evidence, absolute 
rock solid, clear evidence, and, and Sally has some of it, by the way, that, that some T cells are in the islet killing some beta cells. What we don't know is the immune system is supposed to kill abnormal cells. So maybe the beta cell is abnormal in some way and the immune system starts down that path and then it's just not adequately controlled in individuals who go on to get type one diabetes. So I, I do think that there's a component of the immune system, no doubt, but the immune system's really tough to play with. I, I mean, the immune system does tons of good things. And if we could focus a therapy on the beta cell and thereby stop the process, it just seems to me more likely to be safe. 